Okay, we're now going to talk about the adrenal gland and answer the what questions. What is the topography, parts, vascular supply, and histology of the adrenal gland? What hormones are secreted by the adrenal cortex and medulla? And what is the stimulation function and inhibition of adrenal hormones? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. Okay, so the adrenal gland is located on top of the kidney. So there's the right kidney and the left kidney. And on top, of there's the right adrenal gland and the left adrenal gland. Now, adrenal means on top of or beside the kidney. And so that's why it's called the gland beside or on top of the kidney. But it's also on top of, so suprarenal gland is another term that is used. Now, the adrenal gland is retroperitoneal. Now, what does that mean? Well, here we have an axial section through the abdomen is viewed from foot to head like an axial CT. So the liver is in the upper right and the stomach is in the upper left and spleen is the upper left of this uh, section. And there in orange is our parietal peritoneum, the mesothelium lining the wall, and the visceral peritoneum, the mesothelium lining the organs. And in between the two is this space, the peritoneal cavity filled with peritoneal fluid. Now, I mention this because all of that peritoneal, parietal peritoneum, visceral peritoneum, the organs they surround, this is called intraperitoneal, which means that everything behind that is retroperitoneal. Now, this prefix retro means in the past or backward. Like in the past, like in a retro movie or TV series like Stranger Things takes place in 19, in the mid 1980s. Okay. That's when I was in high school and all the fashions and the music and the whole bit go with that. So retro peritoneal are organs in the past, organs past, organs backwards or behind the peritoneum. This includes our right and left kidneys, they're classic retroperitoneal organs in the ureters, but as well as these things, the adrenal glands. There's the right adrenal and the left adrenal gland. Now, the adrenal gland has a cortex and a medulla. So the adrenal cortex is the outer portion. So if we now take and blow up this adrenal gland, there's the adrenal cortex. It's the outside and has these three parts to it, the uh, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. Those are the three different areas or regions of the adrenal cortex. Now, the inner portion is called the adrenal medulla. So what is the vascular supply? Well, the arteries that supply the adrenal gland are through suprarenal arteries. There's three of them. So there's the aorta. And coming off the aorta is this inferior phrenic artery, phrenic dealing with the diaphragm because it supplies the diaphragm. But look, it's got all these little supra, su superior suprarenal arteries that supply the adrenal gland. Coming right off the aorta is also the middle suprarenal artery. And then coming off of the renal arteries are the inferior suprarenal arteries. So all three of those supply the adrenal gland. Now the adrenal gland is drained by suprarenal veins. Now on the left, the left suprarenal vein drains into the left renal vein, which goes directly into the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So the left suprarenal vein drains into the renal vein and sometimes drains into the inferior phrenic vein as well. And so the renal veins drain into the IVC. Now the right kidney is a bit different. Uh, the right adrenal gland is a bit different because the right adrenal gland drains through the right suprarenal vein directly into the IVC. Okay, so now the capillaries. So now let's take a look at a little closer. We're going to take a section of that and blow it up. And there we've got our renal adrenal uh, suprarenal capsule. And then there's the zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. Those three things make the adrenal cortex. And then there's the adrenal medulla. Now, if we look on top, take a look, there's the, an adrenal arterial blood supply that comes in. And then there's our adrenal capillaries that drain down into the adrenal venule. So the zona glomerulosa produces, um, primarily aldosterone, zona fasciculata, primarily cortisol, reticularis, um, androgens and medulla, um, epinephrine. Now watch what happens then is they secrete their hormones into these vessels and shing, they go all the way down to these venules and then out to the direction of the blood flow and wherever the blood takes them and affecting their target tissues. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now the histology adrenal gland is as follows. There is the adrenal capsule. Then there is showing the adrenal cortex with its three areas, the zona glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. So it's three different areas, and you can see the different staining within there. And then right in the middle is the adrenal medulla.
Now we zoom in, we see it and see it. So we just zoom in and you can see all of those different uh, four regions that we care about. Okay, next we're now going to talk about the hormones secreted by the adrenal cortex. And so there we've got the cortex. So there's the adrenal, the zona glomerulosa secretes aldosterone, fasciculata, primarily cortisol, and reticularis, primarily androgens. Now, something to help keep in mind with this is that aldosterone is a mineral corticoid, so it deals with salt. Uh, cortisol is a glucocorticoid, so it deals with sugar, and androgens deal with the sex hormones. So salt, sugar, sex is one way to kind of remember these three hormones. So let's go through them individually now. Let's focus on hormones from the zona glomerulosa, which is primarily aldosterone. Now, aldosterone is secreted by the zona glomerulosa shown there. Now, aldosterone is part of a group called mineral corticoids. That's technically what the zona glomerulosa secretes, but the main one is aldosterone, and it deals with sodium. Or salt. Now, it's a steroid hormone, which means it acts intracellularly. So, aldosterone stimulation function inhibition is going to take this really cool but a little complicated pathway. So, there's the liver, there's our kidney, there's the lungs, and through the lungs is the pulmonary capillary, and then there's the adrenal cortex focusing on the zona glomerulosa. The liver produces a molecule that is called uh, angiotensinogen, which just flows throughout the blood. Now, angiotensinogen is primarily inert until acted upon by an enzyme. Now, this enzyme that is going to be secreted by the kidneys is only secreted or is primarily secreted when blood volume and pressure drop and sodium levels drop sensed by the kidneys, which then secrete renin. Renin is an enzyme that goes and cleaves angiotensinogen to create angiotensin 1, which is now flowing throughout the blood. And when angiotensin 1 flows into the pulmonary capillary, it experiences an enzyme called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, which converts angiotensin 1 shing, into angiotensin 2. Now, angiotensin 2 has a number of really cool properties that targets a number of different tissues that deal primarily with blood pressure and blood volume. One of the things that angiotensin 2 targets is the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex in the house that Jack built. The zona glomerulosa secretes aldosterone. Now, aldosterone is a, a, a steroid hormone that targets the nephrons in the kidney, primarily the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. And aldosterone causes these tubules to increase tubular reabsorption of sodium and chloride. And wherever sodium goes, water follows. So when sodium is reabsorbed from the filtrate into the bloodstream, water follows. So we increase water retention, thus increasing blood pressure and blood volume. It helps with secreting potassium into the filtrate, which is then excreted. And therefore, uh, aldosterone helps to decrease plasma potassium. Um, it also helps with stimulating these uh, the nephron to secrete protons, which helps to regulate pH. So aldosterone is part of the RAS system, which stands for renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So we're just dealing with the aldosterone part of this. Now, another way the zona glomerulosa secretes aldosterone is that ACTH from the pituitary or an increase of potassium in the blood plasma also stimulate zona glomerulosa to secrete aldosterone. Now, next we're going to talk about the zona fasciculata and talk about cortisol. The cortisol is secreted by the zona fasciculata here in this histology. And this is a glucocorticoid, gluco meaning sugar. It helps to regulate sugar in a number of things. But another way to think of this, this is the stress hormone. So it is a steroid hormone, so it acts intracellularly. Um, here we're going to talk about the stimulation function and inhibition of cortisol. Well, the hypothalamus is, so what happens for the hypothalamus to start this process is you either go through a stress response or it's part of the regular circadian rhythm. We'll talk about in a few minutes. So let's say that you have a stressful situation that comes. The hypothalamus then secretes this hormone, CRH, or corticotropin-releasing hormone, which targets cells in the anterior pituitary, which produce and secrete a hormone called ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. And it targets the adrenal cortex, specifically the zona fasciculata, which then produces this mineral corticoid called glucocorticoid, I beg your pardon, glucocorticoid called cortisol, which then flows to the bud by blood by binding to this corticosteroid binding globulin. And then it affects a number of different tissues. 
we use this abbreviation, a big fib. Hold that thought for a minute. So cortisol then, as it increases in blood, will then have a negative feedback to the anterior pituitary and hypothalamus to stop secreting CRH and ACTH to bring cortisol levels back. So cortisol affects tissues in the body that increase appetite. It also increases blood pressure, increases insulin resistance, and increases gluconeogenesis. It also uh, decreases fibroblast activity and thus decreases wound healing. It decreases the or suppresses the immune system in the inflammatory system, and it also decreases bone formation. So therefore, a big fig uh, represents a mnemonic for helping remembering you know, uh, what happens in the effector tissues for when cortisol is secreted. Now, if you have too much cortisol, like a hyper secretion of cortisol, one of the things is results is Cushing syndrome, a prolonged exposure to increased levels of cortisol. And so let's take a look at each one of these in Cushing syndrome symptoms. They have a lot of weight gain because a hyper secretion of cortisol increases appetite, increase of blood pressure, the sense of mechanisms that cause, um, a newly and uh, elevated high bl uh, blood pressure. Uh, it also creates a process of gluconeogenesis and lipolysis to put a lot of glucose into the bloodstream, and that's going to result in insulin resistance and glucose intolerance. Um, fibroblast activity is reduced in, in, and suppresses immune system and inflammatory system. And as a result, you have slow healing of cuts, and your skin becomes more fragile. And then it decreases bone formation, and bones become increased risk of fractures because one of the things cortisol does is reduces the absorption of calcium in your your digestive system. Okay, now that there's other, th I should say there's other things that are involved with this. This is just a short synopsis to show if you have a hyper secretion of cortisol. Now, cortisol, let's talk about the circadian rhythm for a minute uh, and why it, it changes in the amounts it's secreted. So here's a graph with the x-axis represent times of day and the y-axis showing concentrations of cortisol in the blood. So what happens at early, like earlier in the morning, mid-morning, you're all med students and college students, so this is like you're already in class a long time by 9 a.m. Um, so watch what happens as the day progresses is that cortisol levels drop and then it increases again um, all throughout the night. And so the circadian rhythm of normal of cortisol levels in the blood with optimal or higher levels usually being during those morning hours of 8 to 9-ish in the morning. But another thing to, to cause a hyper secretion of cortisol is chronic stress. All right. So now let's talk about the zona reticularis. And we're just going to spend a short time on this one. This secrete, the androgens are secreted by the zona reticularis shown here in this picture. And these are gonadotropic, gonado for gonads, or the sex, primary sex organs, the testes and the ovaries. And these are sex hormones. And so they're also steroid hormones. Now, the stimulation of this is that the hypothalamus secretes CRH, which tells the anterior pituitary to secrete ACTH, which then targets the zona reticularis that makes these weak androgens. Now, they go to effector tissues that deal with where sex hormones go, and it has a negative feedback loop like other adrenal hormones to the pituit anterior pituitary and hypothalamus. Now, the regulatory control and even the function of adrenal sex hormones is not really fully understood, which is why I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it right now. Okay, next we're going to talk about the hormones in the medulla. And the medulla secretes epinephrine. Okay, the medulla. So, um, Epinephrine is secreted by the medulla of the adrenal gland. And these, inside the medulla are these cells called chromaffin cells. Now, chromaffin cells are derived from neural crest cells. So the adrenal cortex is embryologically derived from uh, mesoderm, but the adrenal medulla is derived from neural crest cells. So if you remember in neurulation, this process where when the neural fold happens in the neural groove and you finally get the neural tube, you've got these neural crest cells that do a ton of things in the body, one of which form every ganglion, nervous peripheral nervous ganglion in the body, which includes the adrenal medulla. I'll talk about that in a minute. And so the adrenal medulla secretes catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, the three major ones we talk about. But the major catecholamine that the adrenal medulla secretes, produces and secretes, is epinephrine. And another name for epinephrine is adrenaline. This is the fight or flight response. Um, 
and epinephrine or adrenaline is a peptoid, peptide hormone. We're going to take a bit of a detour for a second. All right, so here we've got sympathetic pathways. And for a sympathetic pathway, you always have two neurons. You have a preganglionic sympathetic neuron and a postganglionic sympathetic neuron right here. So if you have pre and postganglionic, there must be a ganglion. So let's go and zoom in on this for a second, okay? So then what happens is the preganglionic sympathetic neuron secretes acetylcholine which then is going to bind to a nicotinic cholinergic receptor on the postganglionic sympathetic neuron, like this. Shing! And then what happens is, once that binds, it opens up these voltage-gated channels, and then it causes this impulse to continually conduct down that postganglionic sympathetic neuron. Now, why am I talking about this? Now, let's go back and take a look at our adrenal medulla. And so there's our adrenal medulla, and we're going to zoom in on that for a little bit. Now watch, in the preganglionic sympathetic neuron, it's going to secrete acetylcholine, which binds to a nicotinic receptor, a nicotinic cholinergic receptor, to initiate this pathway. That adrenal medulla, where the chromaffin cells are, is this in the sympathetic pathway. The only difference is there's no axon. That cell body of a postganglionic sympathetic neuron is actually the adrenal medulla cells or the chromaffin cells. So chromaffin cells are really a postganglionic sympathetic neuron group cell bodies. It's a ganglion. And it was, instead of then sending an impulse and you just have a release of a catecholamine at a synapse, it secretes it into the blood. So epinephrine then is secreted into the bloodstream and then it flows all throughout the bloodstream until it finally hits some effector tissue where it binds to an adrenergic receptor. And as a result, it increases heart rate and, heart and ventricular contractility. It increases blood pressure, causes bronchodilation, pupil dilation, and so forth. The things that you have in a fight or flight response. And so there is... Um, that neuron I want to focus on for a second. That one, except we're going to put it in a different way. There's the neuron again, where you see it now is the axon flowing from the T12 spinal cord level. And it's a preganglionic sympathetic cell body. You see the cell body in the lateral horn. And notice that this axon comes out the sympathetic ganglion through a splanchnic nerve, specifically the least splanchnic nerve. Now watch as the axon goes by the aortical renal ganglion, it does not synapse because the synapse happens there between the pre and post ganglionic sympathetic neuron, which is actually the adrenal medulla cells or chromaffin cells, which then secrete norepinephrine into the bloodstream. And as we talked about before, they go and they bind to and stimulate adrenergic receptors on an effector organ. Now the adrenal medulla stops secreting epinephrine when the least splanchnic nerve stops innervating it. Um, Let's do this for a second. Let's zoom in. I just want to do this. So there in blue is, an, is epinephrine. Epinephrine. Epi, epi upon nephros, the kidney. So they call this hormone the hormone that comes from above the kidney. But they also call it adrenaline, the hormone that comes from the gland on top of the kidney. So epinephrine or adrenaline are the same things. Now we call this receptor the adrenergic receptor, a receptor that binds adrenaline. So for some reason in the United States, we stick with the Greek word, adrenaline. And we stick with the Latin-based receptor, an adrenergic receptor. In Europe, they stick and they call it, in Europe, they call it adrenaline and the adrenergic receptor, but we don't. And I just mention this because it's sometimes easy to mix up this jargon. And that, my friends, is the adrenal gland in a nutshell. Mm -hmm.